All right, hey everybody, welcome back to another Bio1802 lab. Today we're going to be looking at our, our lab seven, which is animals two. We're going to continue looking at some of the different animals on our planet, specifically those um, that are classified as deuterosomes. But for those who don't know me, my name is Alan Babino. I'm one of the 1802 instructors. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so I'm gonna say, take a moment, pause the video and take a look at the student learning objectives. You guys should be pretty familiar um, looking over these key points that we want you to, to take away from this lesson. So um, yeah, take a moment, read over those, but uh, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and dive right into deuterosomes. So activity one is gonna focus on deuterosomes and the phylum Echinodermata. So we're going to talk about some of the critical innovations that deuterosomes exhibit during embryonic development. Um, as I'm going through this material, be sure that you're watching the videos, that you're looking at the material provided on As You Learn, and that you are going through the handouts as well. And then you can go ahead and take a crack at your worksheets. But, all right. So last week, we talked about protosomes. Um, we talked about sponges, jellyfish, and all our different type of worms and annelids. But this week, we're going to focus specifically on the deuterosomes. So deuterosomes are, or they consist of two phyla, echinodermata and chordata. And what's important about why deuterosomes are deuterosomes, uh, and it comes down to these critical innovations that deuterosomes exhibit. So they have a specific type of embryonic development. And they also have which are like your starfish, sea stars, brittle stars, and then our chordata, which are our chordates, um, a lot of what you think of as vertebrates, your fish, lizards, mammals, but um, there are four phylum, but we're mainly just going to focus on these two. But it is noteworthy that within uh, deuterosomes, we also have hemichordata or hemichordata or hemichordates and um, the phylum xenoturbolidia. All right. So when looking at deuterostome development, uh, we kind of have the side-by-side -side comparison between protosomes and deuterostomes. And one of the main differences we can talk about initially is the difference in cleavage. So remember, we're looking at during embryonic development, we get to this eight cell stage. And you can see that the cleavage in a protosome, you kind of have the this spiral and determinate pattern. Basically, you can look at these cells and they kind of alternate and they're staggered, whereas in this eight-celled stage of the deuterostome, we have radial cleavage with indeterminate um, cells. Basically, with the radial cleavage, you can see that these cells are kind of stacking on top of one another rather than being staggered like in the protosomes. Um, there's also differences in the blastophore. So if we're looking at the fate of the blastophore in part C, we can see that in protosomes, the blastophore will eventually develop into um, the mouth, or I, I guess you could say the mouth develops from blastophore, but in the case of deuterosomes, the anus ends up developing from the blastophore. So one other thing talking about cleavage, um, protosomes have what is known as spiral cleavage, which is determinate, meaning that a, a cell's fate is decided as soon as it's made, whereas in deuterostomes, they have indeterminate um, cells, basically meaning that um, a cell's fate is not decided. Basically, a cell can be any type of cell up until a certain point of development. You can kind of think of it as like stem cells as being cells that have the potential to be anything. But then, all right. So yeah, so deuterostomes have radial cleavage that is indeterminate, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. All right. So as I mentioned before, we can also 
look at um, this specific type of development that deuterostomes have, which is called radial cleavage. And basically, this means that the daughter cells produced in the original zygote cell will sit above each other in previous cleavages. So if you look at this top left image, you can see that as cells are um, dividing within the radial cleavage pattern, that they're dividing and the cells are sitting on top of one another. So instead of being kind of staggered and having this alternating cell pattern like we saw in the protosomes, you can see that the cells are directly on top of each other and they, um, that is a characteristic of radial cleavage. And another aspect of this is that there's intermediate inter, oh man, I can't even talk, but uh, there's indeterminate cleavage. Basically in that, like I was mentioning before, if a cell is excised during development, it can still become a normal embryo, meaning that early in development, cells don't have a specific task. They can basically be anything during the early development. So fate basically is not determined until later in development. So if a cell is lost from a zygote, or not a zygote, but uh, like a developing blastophore, then it's fine. So therefore, if a cell is separated, it can still come back to um, the task of forming embryo if it's separated early enough. And then finally, um, we, like I mentioned in the previous slide, the fate of the blastophore, so rather, um, then becoming the mouth, like it is in a protosome, the blastophore opening will become the anus of a deuterostome. All right. And so looking basically how that looks, again, you have spiral cleavage from our Lafa trochozoans, where you have cell division and the, the new daughter cells are kind of in this alternating staggered pattern is how I like to think of it. But then in radial cleavage, you can see that you have basically the stacking of cells. Whereas the cell divides, they are not staggered from one another and they start to stack on top of each other during cell division. Okay, so now that we talked about some of the basic um, innovations of deuterostome, development, we can go ahead and move on to the first major phylum that we want to talk about today, and that is echinodermata. So echinodermata or echinoderms consist of five different classes. We have astroidea, which are your starfish. You have ophoroidea, which are your brittle stars. You have echinodea, which are your sea urchins and sand dollars. You have holothoroidea, which are sea cucumbers. And then we have crinoidea, which are your sea lilies. So within the phylum, the kind of dermata, there's over 7,000 living species. And all of these species are marine only. They're only found in saltwater ecosystems. They are not found in freshwater. They're not found in terrestrial, only basically in these ocean type systems. Um, adults are pentaradial symmetric, whereas the juveniles are bilaterally symmetric. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but basically the larva for a lot of these species undergo a, a metamorphosis, which drastically change what the larva look like compared to the adult. But because the larva are bilateral, they are placed within bilateria. And then one other really cool thing about conodermatas, which we will talk about more, is that they possess a water vascular system, which is unique to the phylum and it helps some of these species move around as well as even in some um, helps with circulatory functions and moving of like blood through their systems. But, all right, so one of the other critical innovations that we talked about was the endoskeleton that um, stones can form. So the endoskeleton within echinoderms, um, basically all of these echinoderms have an endoskeleton that is composed of these uh, basically calcium ociles and uh, spines. And basically the dermal ociles are composed of calcium carbonate and they provide internal structure and support for the body of these echinoderms. Um, basically they're kind of like these plates and they help to form this large internal skeleton that's called a test. But the 
fossils, cells, um, even uh, those that protrude from the body wall are covered by a thin layer of epidermis. And so even though it might look like an exoskeleton for some species, they are still part of the endoskeleton by definition. But yeah, they look more similar to an exoskeleton like, um, like an arthropod has. All right, so now we can kind of talk a little bit more about each one of these classes. So Astroidea are your starfish, your classic Patrick stars. And uh, we're gonna talk more about all the different um, systems within starfish, but it is important. Um, I would definitely take a minute to pause the video to look at um, this figure, but you guys are going to need to know like the internal structure of a starfish. And we are gonna show a dissection in some of the supplementary materials that I would highly recommend you taking a look at. But basically, starfish should be relatively familiar, especially if you watch cartoons growing up like I did and a lot of SpongeBob. So yeah, your classic Patrick star. All right. So the next class we're gonna talk about is Echinidea, which are your sea urchins and sand dollars. For these guys, it's not super important to know the internal structure of um, these sea urchins, but one thing that is pretty cool about sea urchins and sand dollars is that they have this very unique mouth part on the bottom of them called Aristotle's lantern. It's a cool mouthpiece, um, definitely worth taking a look at, but for your classic um, sea urchins and sand dollars. I mean, you have these balls of what look like pins or needles. Um, again, if you grew up watching something like SpongeBob, a lot of these organisms should look pretty familiar to you. And then you also have sand dollars, which are these very flat um, organisms that kind of have the star shape in the center. Again, should be relatively familiar to you all and just connecting that Sea urchins and sand dollars fall within the class Echinidea. All right, so moving on with some of our echinoderms or echinodermata, we have our next class, which is Holothuroidea, which are sea cucumbers. Again, with this class, we really don't want to put too much detail into understanding the internal structure of these organisms rather than recognizing what these organisms are and what class they fall within. So as the name, the common name might imply, sea cucumbers kind of look like cucumbers. They come in all different shape sizes and are found on the ocean floor. Yeah, some of these exhibit tentacles, whereas others just look like cucumbers or pickles on the bottom of the ocean. But all right, let's go ahead and we'll move on to our next class. So Afroidea are your brittle stars. And again, this one is often confused with sea stars, which again, like starfish fall within Astroidea, whereas brittle stars are Ophroidea. But one major difference between starfish versus brittle stars is that brittle stars have a much more defined central disc with basically the center point of their body. And then their arms tend to be um, much longer and more defined, Com well, longer and skinnier, not so much defined compared to a starfish. So as you can see, they have these long arms and a very small, defined central disc. All right. And finally, our last class that we're going to talk about is which are sea lilies. And this group of organisms is very few, there's very few of them left in the wild. They are an existent species, but uh, were much more abundant during the Paleozoic era. Um, you can find a lot of these in the fossil records, but um, there aren't many existent species left. But as adults, um, the sea, li sea lilies stem and are basically attached to substrates with a crown at the top. They kind of look like a plant in a way, but they are an animal. The crown part of the plant is made up of the arms of the echinoderm, but they are fairly feather-like 
And they basically use these feather-like protrusions. They kind of use them like arms to help capture their prey. And then um, they also have a mouth, which uh, radiates out of a central point where basically that's where they go to eat. But, all right. So those are kind of our five main classes that we're going to be talking about. But we're going to go into more detail specifically for starfish. So when looking at the starfish life cycle, we can see that um, when we start as an adult, we're producing our gametes. So we produce our egg and our sperm via meiosis. We get fertilization between egg and sperm and the zygote is formed, basically that fertilized egg, that single diploid cell. We start to get cell division via mitosis at this point and we become an eight stage cell. And as mitosis continues to occur, you get the formation of a blastula. Um, again, we're gonna keep go undergoing mitosis and eventually become our immature larva. And the larva of starfish undergo a metamorphosis in which they go from having this bilateral symmetry into what we think of as an adult starfish. And so there's a variety of different forms that a larval starfish can exhibit, but they all are bilaterally symmetric. So it's not too important to understand all the different potential shapes of a starfish larva as much as it is important to understand that you have these small larvae that are bilaterally symmetric and they will undergo metamorphosis resulting in kind of this drastic change in body shape and size, which eventually brings us to what we think of as a classic starfish. All right, so if we look at the deuterostome development in Echinodermata, again, kind of following that life cycle, we have a single diploid cell with your zygote, the fertilization of egg and sperm. We start to undergo mitosis and we get cleavage of the zygote into an, the eight-celled stage. And then after that, we get the development of the blastula from the eight-celled stage, kind of following this along in number four, further development of the blastula, i.e. continued mitosis, eventually leads to the formation of the blastophore, which deuterosomes will eventually turn into their anus. Um, continuing forward, at stage five, you can start to see the development is moving along. You get this full blastophore formation, i.e. you have gastrulation occurring, and you get the formation of um, the digestive tract. And step six, we're becoming closer to an immature starfish. And basically at this stage, we have development into the larval stage, where again, you can start to see that bilateral symmetry of the organism. And then finally, we get to stage seven, which is the immature starfish. And again, remembering that within starfish, we get um, metamorphosis of the immature starfish into the mature starfish, and you get drastic changes in um, body shape and size. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and talk about the external anatomy of the starfish before moving into the internal anatomy of the starfish. So basically we're gonna take a look at the dorsal side of the starfish first, and we're gonna go back and forth between this kind of live specimen as well as this illustrated specimen. But basically on the dorsal side of the starfish, we have the anus where um, basically the leftover food is excreted from the body of the starfish. We have the matriforite, which is a pore on the, the dorsal side of the starfish that allows for the intake of water into the water vascular system, which we'll go into more detail with in just a little bit. And then we can see that there's this central disc that kind of the different arms of the starfish radiate from. And one cool thing about starfish that we'll talk more about when we get into the nervous system is that they do have these sensory eye spots located on each one of the arms of the starfish. And even though they're eye spots, they don't 
actually have vision in terms of what you and I think of as vision, being able to see things clearly, but rather they're able to detect light and dark, which allows them to um, help find prey and move around, or not so much moving around, but know where to move. But, all right. So when we look at the venture side of a starfish, you'll notice that in the center of the center, there's a mouthpiece that the starfish uses to eat its prey. You've got this umbilical groove that run along like the center of each of the arms of the starfish. And then we have these two feet that kind of run along the side of each uh, umbilical groove. So we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail, but starfish are um, fairly flexible because um, the calcium carbonate ocelles that they have on outside of them fit together very loosely. So even though they kind of have this rigid exoskeleton that's not a true exoskeleton, they're still able to move around fairly flexibly. But all right, so now we can go ahead and move on to the specifics of the water vascular system. So I've talked a little bit about this already, but basically the water vascular system at um, kind of dramatas exhibit are these networks of fluid-filled canals derived from the coleum. And basically what this does is it allows for gas exchange, feeding, sensory reception, and locomotion for these organisms. And um, there is some variation between the different classes of uh, echinoderms, but we're really just gonna focus on what it looks like in starfish. So you can see that there's this exterior opening um, through the body, through a seed like organ called the matroporite, which I pointed out on the last slide, is basically just this pore that allows for the intake of water into the starfish's body. And um, if we're following the matroporite down, it's linked to this slender duct called the stone canal, which extends down to a ring canal, which is in like the central disc portion of the starfish. So you can see, uh, let me put a pointer on, but basically, if you can see where my mouse is moving in the central portion of the starfish, there's this central ring that um, encircles the mouth of the starfish, and then branching off from the ring into each one of the arms of the starfish, we have these radial canals that, ex yeah, they extend along the arm of starfish and brittle stars, and they end in a series of ampullae. Let's see. But um, the ampulla can protrude through the pores to the uh, skeleton known as tube feet. And basically what happens with these is that the ampulla pumps fluids within the vascular or the water vascular system into the tube feet, causing them to extend and contract, basically, which helps with the starfish's locomotion. But yeah. Going into a little more detail about that, um, within these radial canals, you have these, the ampulla, which are like these fluid filled bulbs. They will contract, which forces water into these underlying appendages underneath each one of the arms, basically those little tube feet. And um, yeah, this basically helps our fish move along the surface or like the ocean floor. And if you've ever seen a starfish move, you'll basically see this kind of crawling like motion that starfish exhibit. And that is in part because of the water vascular system moving water through the starfish. All right, so we talked a little bit about the water vascular system. Now we can go ahead and talk about the digestive system of a starfish. So starfish have this pretty interesting digestive system. It is a complete digestive system that has both a mouth and an anus for the movement of food through the body. But besides that, when a starfish obtains food, it's being brought to the mouth, which is on the venture side of the body, which is um, basically the food is brought to that mouth utilizing the tube feet. But in some species, they actually have this first stomach, also known as a cardiac stomach, which basically allows for the starfish to put their stomach 
outside of their body to help them digest food. So kind of this external digestion and like, yeah, it's pretty interesting that they have multiple means of obtaining food, but, um, or digesting food. And basically this cardiac stomach is connected to these different digestive glands. So if we look at the digestive system of a sea star, you'll see that within each one of the arms of the sea star, there's these two different digestive glands along with a set of gonads. But um, again, that's not really part of the digestive system. But basically there's these digestive glands and each one of the arms which allow for the aid of digestion um, within each one of the arms. And then finally, you have nutrient absorption that occurs within these digestive glands that extend down the length of the arms. And once the food has been properly digested, it ends up getting excreted out of the anus or the mouth, which I find is kind of interesting that it has a specific place to excrete via the anus, but it can still use its mouth for that as well. All right. So, so the circulatory system of echinoderms is pretty interesting in that they have an open circulatory system. So if we think of what a closed circulatory system is, is pretty similar to like what humans have where our blood is carried via arteries and veins. But with an open circulatory system, that is not the case. Rather, that blood suffuses through the body and uh, may be in direct contact with the environment at times. But um, within the circulatory system of echinoderms, they don't actually have a true heart. They have blood that lacks a pigment that flows kind of freely through the different body cavities or coleums. And in this way, blood kind of bathes visceral organs and is involved with transporting dissolved nutrients and respiratory gases all internally. So there aren't like those different blood passages like veins and arteries that we're used to thinking of when we think of a circulatory system. But another interesting aspect of the circulatory system in echinoderms is that the water vascular system helps in the aid of circulation, basically by using the pumping of water through the starfish, it helps to circulate fluids through the body. All right, so we're also, we're gonna build on the water vascular system a little bit more when talking about the respiratory system and echinoderms. But basically, again, because they're moving water through their system, they're also utilizing that pathway for other aspects of their life. So basically, when using the water vascular system, these echinoderms are allowing oxygen to enter the body via simple diffusion through these um, thin layers of dermal tissue, which are on the end of the two feet and then end up entering the water vascular system. So for some species, diffusion occurs directly across the skin rather than just um, going through it. And then with some starfish, they also have what are called skin gills. They kind of look like these little knobby projections on the skin of the starfish, and um, they help to aid in respiratory functions. All right. So we've talked about a variety of different systems within the starfish, and we're gonna kind of finish up with the nervous system. So echinoderms do have a nervous system. As I mentioned before, they are able to sense light. They don't have true vision, but they do have these tiny little eye spots on the, basically the ends of the dorsal side of each one of their arms. And these eye spots allow for the detection of light versus dark, not like what we think of as true vision, but it helps them to um, basically know where to move. But in addition, some of their two feet are sensitive to chemicals and are able to find food through chemotaxis, which is basically just a fancy way of saying that the movement is guided by um, a chemical cue or stimulus. But in terms of how the nervous system is dispersed within a starfish, they have, we can think of it similar to how the water vascular is in that there's this kind of central ring with it. Well, it's a central nerve ring, but basically again, kind of a ring in the central portion of the, the body of the starfish. It surrounds the gut and it connects nerves to this central rotation from 
the center of the starfish. But there's also these radial nerves that run through the length of each one of the arms, similar to the water vascular system, where the nerves are running through each one of the arms along the inner surfaces of the body cavity. And um, that's pretty much how the nervous system of a starfish is dispersed through its body. But overall, that's our introduction to echinoderms. If you have any questions in regard to the material, feel free to rewatch the video, as well as reach out to either me or one of the other lab instructors. And I will see you in the next video.